Good morning. Well, I, uh, I am uh, I was thinking about those songs. They, it doesn't seem that long ago, but on the other hand, it seems like a long time ago. I love the old music. Yeah. And uh, I know the Lord loves it too because, um, you know, we sing with a right heart. He does it, you know, it's like my, my grand, I have a couple of grandkids who sing to the, you know, terribly. <laughs> but it's the best sound and stuff on the planet. And uh, that's how the Lord sees us. You know, um, there's some things coming up pretty quick that I know you're aware of, like, a, like an election. You guys were aware, right? Um, you know that uh, as a church, when we get five minutes to talk about anything, it's not going to necessarily be about um, politics. And, and so um, we don't do that all the time. Uh, what we talk about is being a Christ follower, a disciple of Jesus, one who has uh, been baptized into Christ Jesus and uh, is now living a new life, the old life gone, the, the new life living for Jesus, and we're becoming mature in our faith. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear that if we have a relationship with God and we're mature in our faith, then we're able to discern what kinds of decisions we need to make. Uh, uh, we're in this world, we are uh, a part of it, but we're not of it, the scripture says. So as Christians, we have a, a different view of planet Earth. We want to be Christ followers, biblical disciples. We want to be mature and, and make biblical decisions. But at the same time, we've already been sort of told how this whole thing ends up. And, and so we do the best we can to be light while we're here in our slice of history. And... Um, bring our perspective of what is important to everything we do. It's not church is church and business is business. It's, it's Jesus is our Lord and Savior of every part of our life. So um, a couple of things. In the next few weeks during directed prayer, we're going to be uh, just really focusing on uh, our country, our people, and so we'll be doing that. We are having uh, November 3rd, we are going to have a 6.30 uh, Sunday evening uh, prayer uh, time. Anybody wants to come in and pray the, the, the Sunday before the election, we're praying. Um, it, it, it's, we're not going to be political. We are going to be spiritual. We're going to be Christ followers and pray. Um, and for those of you who want to know, you know my perspective on all this, I actually did an interview with the Relational Discipleship Network and, it's, and uh, I explained my view. Now, I'm pretty sure that there are some of you in here that will disagree with my view, but I also am pretty sure I'd probably disagree with some of your views. Would you agree with that? But the point being is, here's what I think we have to do. We have to go, okay, um, we have, uh, everything we've got has been given to us by the Lord, and we need to steward it well. And in our country, we were given the ability to vote. And biblically, I think as a mature disciple, you need to vote biblically. And it isn't about, oh, in Idaho, it doesn't matter. You know, it's going to be, no, it's you were given a responsibility and a privilege because of other people's faithfulness. I, I, I say this, um, it, it, and again, there's no perfect candidate in this election because Jesus isn't on the ballot. But I just think of it this way. This is something I, I would explain it this way. If I was a, a Christian in the time of uh, the first church, and, and they weren't given the right to vote on which Caesar in Rome was going to be uh, Caesar. But I want you to imagine Nero for a minute. Nero, uh, a historical figure, just a wretched man. And uh, he... Um, he would torture and kill Christians. In fact, he's responsible for killing um, directly Peter and, and uh, uh, Paul. And um, let's just imagine for a minute that there was another Caesar that we could vote for. One Caesar is trying to snuff out Christianity, is trying to force people to actually worship him as a god. 
That's what Nero did with, uh, with, with Paul, said, if you'll offer incense to me as to a God, then you can live. And, he's, and Peter, Paul said, no, there's only one God, God the Son, Jesus is Lord, and you're not him. And I'm going to honor you as uh, Caesar unless you ask me to do something unbiblical. And right now, the answer is no, I will not worship you. And so he was killed. You got one who will uh, force you to do things, and then the other will, will not be a believer really, but at least leave you alone to worship. And uh, I, if I had to vote, I would choose the one who would leave us alone and let us worship as Christ followers. Is that making sense to you? And so I'm not going to tell you what to do. That's between you and the Lord. But I am going to tell you that I think it's a responsibility to vote. And I pray that you will do that biblically. And it matters. It, locally in particular, we have some, some, uh, some of them are better than others. And we want to have a place where we can worship and make, be a light here as much as we can. But at the same time, if it doesn't go the way we want, um, it, it, God's not going to wake up on Wednesday morning and go, wow, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and whatever God allows, he will help us get through. And I'll just be honest with you, uh, sometimes I hope it, it gets harder because when, when we have it easier, we tend to worship our stuff. We, sh- we tend to, to uh, take things easy and it seems like hard times wakes us up. So I hope it gets as hard as it has to get so that people will come to know Jesus and take him seriously. So whatever that looks like. We're in a series right now called One. So let's dive into the word. Let's get to uh, the most important stuff. Uh, We're doing a series that we do in one form or another every year about uh, who we are, what God says a church is, where we're going, what we're about. And we do this in our membership class and our leadership stuff. We remind people we were given a mission and God hasn't changed his mind. We were told to go and make disciples, baptizing and teaching. We were told to be his church. And we see the model of that in Acts 2 and all the way through where, yes, they met in the weekend services, but they did life together. They met from house to house. That's why we're structured the way we are. We like that we have a whole lot of people. That's a good thing. I think, uh, you know, some people are like, who are all these people? Uh, Well, they're people God's drawing, and God wants to save everybody. So which one do you want to kick out? Right? Tell not to come. No, uh, we want to reach people, and together we have some power that we can, we can give and do things around the world in our community. There's power there, but, there, but it's in an individual faith, uh, relational faith, in our home groups and life together, where now we get to know each other, and we do life together, and we support one another. And, and so it's both and. The church was always supposed to be both and. And... Uh, And so we want people to know what we're doing, why we're doing it, where we're going. And we want to remind people because it's easy to forget. And we've been looking at biblical words from the text in Ephesians 4. And one of the problems we have as a, a church in America in particular is there's all these different ways people define these words. There's all these different versions of Christianity, and unless we can get aligned here and work together with a, with a shared language and a shared direction, we, are not, we can't win as a team. There isn't a business, there isn't a uh, government, there isn't a church, there isn't a symphony, there isn't a team. If, you, if you're playing by different playbooks, if you have different languages for each word, it gets really hard to work together. And Jesus said a house divided against itself can't stand. So we're trying to say to our people, here's what the Bible says. This is what it means. This is what it meant to the first church. Therefore, this is what it means to us. And we're reminding our people because there's so many internet Google searches going on out there. There's so many different versions of stuff. But we're also saying to those of you who are new, we want you here. We want you to know what we're about. We want you to join us in this mission to represent Jesus to the world, to be ambassadors of Christ, to be disciples who make disciples. So that's what we're doing in this series. And we, let me just read this text to you. This is in Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, this is where we get the title of this series. It says this, as a prisoner, Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, 
I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now he's, he's saying uh, you've, been, you've gotten, been given a calling. Remember the church in the Greek in the New Testament is ecclesia. And it means the called out one. So we've been called out of something, but called to something. So he says, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Then he's going to talk about the heart things and the head things. Here's the heart things that will make us one. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Now, stop right there. Here's what he's saying. If we're going to be one... We're going to have to be humble and gentle and bear with one another. Why are we having to bear with one another? Well, because though we may be saved and declared righteous, we are oftentimes a broken lot. We have uh, differences, personality differences, uh, histories. We have all kinds of different things. And so a, a mature person in Christ, one who is able to be a part of the body, the family, to be one is going to be a person who is humble and, and gentle with disagreements. They are they're going to bear with one another, put up with each other's differences. How many of you have been married more than five years? Uh, do you have to bear with one another's differences because of your love? Love isn't always a feeling. In fact, the Bible says the word in the Greek, love there is agapao. It means an act of the will to lay down your life for the other. Love is a decision you make to lay down your life for the other. And 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 I'm, I'm really glad my wife makes that decision daily, multiple times a day in my case. Because I can do some irritating things. I know you have, that's hard for any of you to believe, but it's true. Now, he says, I want you to be one relationally. But then he starts in verse four. He says, there is one body. He's talking about the church here. And one spirit, the Holy Spirit, just as you were called uh, to one hope. We're gonna get, that's, the, that's what we're gonna dive in today, uh, into that. When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. So he keeps using this word one, 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 one. He's trying to create one out of the many. And, uh, and, and there's nothing easy about that. Nothing easy about that. So this concept of oneness is really important. And when you think about the things we have in common, he actually starts clear back in Ephesians 2. Remember Ephesians 2? Uh, 1 and 2, then build, 3 builds on that, 4 builds on that, 5, 6. But uh, there's some things we have in common that could possibly uh, deter us from becoming one. Just flip back a couple of uh, uh, pages in your scriptures or scroll in your phone or your iPad. But look what it says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. As for you, he's, he's writing to the Ephesian church, but to all the individuals as well. As to you, or as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Notice that's past tense. You used to live this way. You were dead in your transgressions, which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. So he's, he's saying to the Ephesians, you all started out in the same place, but lest uh, he, get, he be proud, Paul then says this, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. So he basically, you know, he talks about being completely humble and gentle in chapter four. Well, before you're going to be completely humble and gentle, he wants to even the playing field. And he says, all of us, All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, pride can sneak into a church. What's that guy doing here? What's that lady here? Oh, I remember her from high school. I remember, you know, uh, oh, those are Californians. I saw Californian license plates in the GGB. And... uh, 
Guess what? In California, they have the same problem we do here in Idaho. A bunch of sinners. Uh, we, we have something in common. We all, by nature, were objects of God's wrath. So I just want to make this point, you know. Sometimes we can be Pharisees. In the story Jesus tells us uh, about a, in, in the synagogue, uh, in comes a tax collector, and he goes up to the front, and he gets on his knees, and uh, he's just praying to God, and he's beating his chest, forgive me, God, I'm a sinner. And the Pharisee in the back, he's like, dear God, thank you that I'm not like that Pharisee up there. And, you know, I just want you to know this. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride kills your relationship with God. Pride kills your relationship with others. Pride will kill you personally. It goes before a fall. Pride. And so he says, hey, we were all by nature objects of God's wrath, but we have something in common if, we've, if we're in Christ Jesus, if we received him. He goes on, verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Now, it, again, we turn Christianity into this me and Jesus thing. Uh, me and Jesus. My, my, my uh, church is in the woods. Me and Jesus. It was never supposed to be just you and Jesus. Now, it's first and foremost you and Jesus. But when you're walking with Jesus, it leads you to love others. It leads you from a me and I to a we and us. Notice he says, but he made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. All right, now I, I want you to get a picture. Uh, notice it says in here that we started out uh, in a difficult situation. We were dead spiritually. But then it also says that we have an internal enemy, flesh. We all have flesh. We all have sinful desires at war within us. It may not be the same. Not everybody has the same. Some uh, have an issue with covetousness. They want what somebody else has all the time. It's never enough. Some have uh, attraction for sex. Uh, maybe their dad gave them porn when they were young. And uh, so they've had this battle inside that maybe somebody else doesn't understand. Some have same-sex attractions. Attractions uh, it, it, towards something that's ungodly in a different way. It's, it's ungodly. And, it, and it, it not, listen, it, you, you may not even be able to control that you have same-sex attractions. Uh, you know, something happened in your life and you've just been that way. But no, just like a man who might uh, have attraction towards a, a, a woman, it, it, when it's not godly, it's destructive. And, uh, you, you know, God has a way of living that is righteous uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. Sex is between a man and a woman. It, there's things that are right and wrong. We don't have all the same issues, but we have the same issue. And God, who is rich in mercy, wants to save us. Whereas the world says, follow your heart. Chase what you want. Pursue your, if you can't, if you don't make yourself happy, then you know what? That's the most important thing. Nobody else, be, and all, all the lies the enemy will tell you that will destroy your relationship with God, destroy you, and destroy your relationship with others. And so, what we see here is we have the same problem. We have the devil working, the spirit of the air here, working against us. He closes Ephesians 6 with that. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. So now, as he's going through this passage, he says, now you have the same, uh, you have one baptism, you have, you have uh, one faith, the faith, which includes the gospel and the lifestyle. We're to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And so he's going through and he's saying, all these many people and ideas and brokenness, listen, with Christ's help, we will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with the word as a light, as the more mature spiritual parents investing, we're gonna create, with, if we'll surrender to the Lord, we're gonna become one, uh, 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 one body, the church, uh, one, one spiritual nation, the community of believers, uh, the temple, the living temple, the family of God. All of this is wrapped into the book of Ephesians. Now today, here's what I want to do in the next 
few minutes is I want to focus in on this word hope. He says we have one hope. Now remember, this is in the context of creating out of the many one. Now again, if you understand the Bible, if you go to the first few pages, God creates the world and he tells you how it all started and he tells you how it got this way. It's broken. If you flip to the end of the scriptures, he tells you how it ends. He tells you how it ends. And uh, this phase of eternity will phase out the one we're in right now and he's got a new version a new thing. For those who have accepted him, there'll be something new, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but I want you to get a picture of this. What he's saying to all these people is, because of this one faith you have, this shared faith, you have also a shared hope. And he's pointing them uh, to the eternal here. I want you to flip over to Revelation real quick, and, and uh, Revelation kind of unfolds the spiritual things that are happening uh, around the end times, and the scenes in heaven, and, and John the apostle, the last living disciple, uh, writes the book of Revelation. And as he is writing, he's talking about his, the scene in heaven, and uh, there's a scroll that kind of tells what's going to happen in the end, and there's this... Uh, question in heaven, who is worthy to open the scroll? And it's silent. Nobody is there. But then all of a sudden, one comes into the throne room who is worthy to open the scroll. And it's Jesus. Listen to what it says in Revelation 5 verse 8. And when he had taken it, the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. You were slain. And with your blood, you purchased, God's, uh, for, uh, you purchased for God persons from, no, I love this, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve God, and they will reign on the earth. I, I love this, folks. I, I, one of the things that I can't stand, I mean, I just can't stand it, is racism. I hate it. Um. I get to go all around the world and see amazing people of every color. And one of the things I hate is I hate being told I'm being racist. I hate that. Um, I hate race politics. I hate all that. Unless there's real racism. If there is, then it, it's wrong. And it was Christians it, it, that uh, actually uh, ended that practice in England and that spread to the United States. I hate it. As a historian, I hate it. People died to stop it in our country. And yet, I know it still exists in the hearts of some people, even here and everywhere. And, uh, and racism, uh, prejudice, folks, is a part of your sinful nature. It should never be justified. It should never be justified because it, it's a part of your flesh. Prejudice is in every country and every race. When I was in uh, Africa, uh, it was tribal. Everybody's the same color, but if you're not in this tribe, they kill you if you're in that tribe. But we don't even need different colors. We can be like, hey, they live on that street. Or they live in those, or they go to that school. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's, I love this passage, this hope. And, and again, uh, remember, Ephesians is written, he has to go into half of a chapter on the fact that Jews and Gentiles were supposed to be together in the kingdom. The Jews aren't liking the Gentiles, the Gentiles aren't liking the Jews, and he's like, hey, uh, the two are going to become one in Christ Jesus. The plan was always through the Jews, all the nations of the earth would be blessed and become a part of the kingdom. And this is what this is talking about here in Revelation. There is this oneness in every tongue, every tribe, every nation. And I'm just telling you, if you're, a, if you're a racist, you are not gonna like heaven. 
They don't give you your own street based on color there. It, it, I love that. There's this one hope. He, it, here's the deal. It, you, the, the Gentiles, you know, some were Greeks, some were different countries. The Gentiles had a problem. And it, listen, he's putting to death in Christ the sinful nature, the dividing spiritual force that separates us. And, and God is the, is the uh, person who brings people together. He's the one who shows us how to love God and love others. And the devil is constantly separating and lying and deceiving and dividing. And in Christ, we're going to be one. We have one conclusion to the story. I love this in Revelation 21. It gives us a picture of this. He says, uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old order, uh, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. Some people have a problem with imagining heaven. I, I don't. I just, I just see it like the Garden of Eden before we all jacked it up because of sin. Beautiful, amazing, and God walks with his people again. God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve before sin. I love it. And and the sea was also gone. My wife always says, but I like the sea. I, I really do believe this is a metaphor. He's not saying there's no ocean in the new heaven and the new earth. He's, uh, the sea represented the tumult the, 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 the waves crashing into one another, the sea and the waviness and all that. There's no more craziness. If, you're, if your life is like a ship uh, on the sea, there's no more seasickness from the crazy waves. I, I, go, I love fishing, but I, I, I hate to say this, but I chum out the side of the boat almost every single time. I get so seasick. Probably didn't need to share that. That's the big joke when I go on the ocean. Jim will be under, down there, throwing up. It says this, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of, from out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. See, that, that's, that's our hope. It, it, it's not the hope of uh, one uh, president winning over the others as though that's going to change everything. Oftentimes what you find out is when you have a, a hope based on uh, uh, the wrong things, you get disappointed. Not, again, I'm not saying we don't get involved in the things we should and have to make hard choices and some choices are better than the others. I'm just saying he's pointing these people not to a government uh, on planet earth, but to the government where Jesus sits on the throne perfect king of kings and lord of lords. He's saying, listen, there's this hope. That's where we're going to end up. And, and it's so interesting, the kinds of things we can get through when, we, when we, can, we have something to look forward to. And that's what he's doing because some of these Christians are being beaten up and tortured and, and losing their businesses. And, and, and people are getting sick and dying. I mean, planet earth was planet earth 2,000 years ago. And, and there's stress and trauma and abuse and, and, and political, you know, deception and, and all that was existing. And so he's, he's dealing with people that are doing life on planet earth, but he's reminding them that we have an eternal hope to look forward to. Uh, using this example I've used before, hey, I can get through a lot this week when hunting season starts on the 25th. Yeah, how do I do it? I just keep looking up. I'm like down here, look up. Oh yeah, down here looking up. Some of you, it's uh, you're you're you uh, have a brand new grandbaby coming in a week, and I can get through a lot this week. It might be uh, you're going to Hawaii next week. It might be you know, and, and what he's doing is he's saying, hey, lift up your eyes and keep your eternal perspective in mind. That's how it ends. The beginning of the book is how it started. That's how it ends for those who believe. 
for those who are in Christ, as he says in chapter one, for those who have received God's grace by faith, But he's not just talking about an eternal hope, he's also talking about a temporary hope. If you go back to Ephesians 2, you're saved by grace through faith, not not of yourselves, it is a gift of God so that you can't boast about it, you can't brag about it, you didn't do it, you just received it, God did it for you. But then he says, but you're created anew, he says you are, I love how the New Living Translation puts it, you are God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus, four good works which God planned for you to do before time began. He's saying to people that as they come to know Christ, I want you to hear this, they're coming to know Christ and they're looking back at their past. They were dead in their transgressions and sins. And they used to do that and yes, the world was filled with shame and all that, but now that they've become Christians, they look back at their past and people go, You just blew it too much. You went too far. And maybe that voice is in their own head. How could God forgive me for everything that I've done? But but in Christ, we've been created anew in Christ Jesus. We're a new creation with God's help. So now, not only do I have an eternal hope, I have Jesus in my life. He, He created me for good works, which he planned for me to do before time began. I remember when I got saved, and, 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 and I was like, okay, good. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me from hell. It's a real place of eternal existence. It really exists. I'm so glad that I don't have to go there. But here's how I thought. I've blown it in every possible way. I may be saved, but I've made such a mess of my life. I, I, it's like alcoholic, check one strike. You know, I, I had three strikes, every, every part of my life, and it's like, so I'll, I'll just, until heaven, I mean, I've blown it, I'm a mess, I, I, I can't, and the enemy loves to do that. Oh, great, well, you know, he, first of all, he'll challenge whether you're saved, but then once you're saved, you'll challenge whether you have anything to contribute, anything to offer, anything that, that you know, because your past, it's right there. You did this and this and this, and sometimes people are back there telling you, you did this and this and this, and they won't forgive you, so it's hard to forgive yourself, and, and, there, and it seems like there's no hope for being a part of something significant. But God says that he's making you into a new masterpiece for good works, which he planned for you to do. You. You. But not just you, us. Because he's, he's writing it to individuals, but he's also writing it to the, the whole family of God. He says, I have good things for you to do. No, even if the world comes against you, even if it doesn't care about what goes on with, uh, with you or what you're about, and they think you're silly and they think you're stupid, I am going to use you collectively and individually to do something that changes the world. You can have hope no matter what it looks like. There are seasons, there are seasons where you will go through time and struggle and and, and they're dark seasons, but God's word has been given to us to remind us that no matter what it looks like, whatever the government does, whatever uh, people do, we can have hope individually and collectively as a part of a community. God has eternal things for us to do. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes um, I can get into a hole and I can, uh, um, I can it, it, whatever struggle I'm having, uh, I get focused on that struggle or those struggles. And it, it, I don't know if it's this way for you, but I have a hard time thinking through all the things God has done for me and I have a really easy time focusing on what's not going right, especially the longer it goes. Anybody else in here? And and the enemy just starts whispering, you don't have, you can't have any hope. I mean, where is God? It's been so long. This has taken so long. And you know what, just take matters into your own hands. God's taking his time, do it your way. Don't trust, don't wait upon the Lord. Where is he? Does he even exist? 
And as you walk through that, it, 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 again, especially as it takes a while, you're going to have to decide to put on the helmet of salvation. You're going to have to decide to make a choice. Will I give in to my fear, my anger, my frustration, my hopelessness? Or will I, by faith, choose to trust God and take the next right step? Even when I'm like, what's the point? What's the point? I, I love this passage, and it's been I I important in my walk with God. I, I, I read it again this last week. He says, Psalm 139, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Doesn't feel like that, God. Doesn't feel like you know me. If you did, then you'd know it's a struggle. It's painful. The world seems to be going crazy. He says, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. As I'm reading that, I'm thinking, what does the Lord Jesus say about that? I love what Jesus says. He says, there isn't a sparrow that falls to the ground apart from the knowledge of the Father. He knows the very numbers of hairs on your head. But that voice of hopelessness, well then where is he? Why is, why is it taking so long? So I keep reading. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, you Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. He goes on to say, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Yeah, but God, it's gone so far. I mean, there's... <laughs> There's so much damage. I love this. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Romans 8. For, we don't, for example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows this, what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us. Believers, uh, pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. I, I just think through this battle that goes on in your head and on in my head, this battle to hope. But, you know, he, he, again, there's the personal part of that, but there is the corporate part of that. I don't know how many times there have been people in my life who I've been able to share my own hopelessness with, and they've listened, and, and you know what they didn't say to me? I, I love it. They didn't go, well, you're a pastor. You should be better than that. I love that they never said that. I love that they said Sometimes nothing, except just to hug me and to uh, pray with me, to remind me of the other times they've known me for years when I felt that way, to help me lift my chin up. Where does my help come from? To help me lift my chin up and take God and his perspective into view. And that's, what, that's what's going on here. We're talking about one hope 
we have one hope together. He's not just saying we have one eternity together, although he is saying that. He's saying together we encourage one another with this one hope. We encourage one another daily so that our hearts are not hardened by sin's deceitfulness. That's what we do. We come and we hear this in church, and, but then we, we live this out helping each other carrying one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. As we do that, we become a community where, a a culture where hope is present. I don't know what's going to happen with the election. I don't know what's going to happen with your grandma who's dying, or your husband, or your kid who's uh, a drug, drug addict on the street. I don't know what God's going to do. But I know because we have a God who loves us, we can have hope that what it looks like is not all there is. I pray that this one hope guides us to the finish and because we encourage one another with hope, we get there together. We're going to take communion, and this reminds us, as we all take our eyes off of, uh, uh, you know, ourselves for a minute, and we focus on what he did for us. We all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but those of us who have received Christ, he paid that price for us, and now he's working in us, and, and sometimes he's not as fast as we would like. But he's involved, he cares, he knows. And we can have hope. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are, that you do lift our chin, that we do have hope in you. Even for the things that seem hopeless. Like like Jesus dead seemed hopeless to the disciples, but when he rose from the dead, you showed us that you can do anything. Thank you, Lord. Help us to trust you and have faith that hopes. In Jesus' name, amen.